thanks for coming to our session and let's start. So this is our safe harvest statement. Today I would like to talk about why is HTML5 relevant first a little bit and then dive straight into one application case. A little bit about us, I'm David, this is John or JB. We bought from Oracle for the last several years. We've been working primarily on, on tools for developers, for you guys. Now, why is HTML5 relevant? And especially how does it fit into Java enterprise story? Like there are many answers to that questions and probably what HTML5 means. So I would like to, I would like to answer it by quickly looking at, at, a, at a, like quickly looking at the history of software development. One of the earliest projects I work on <coughs> looked like this. It was a system from 80s. It was Unix server connected with text terminals. The only reason why I'm mentioning is that it's actually very similar to, sorry. The only reason why I'm mentioning is that this is very similar to, to current web model. Basically, everything runs on a server and there's a browser or text terminal in this case which displays stuff from a server. In, in 90s, when with cheap PCs, this, the text terminal solution wasn't like sufficient enough, so it got like a people users had wanted to utilize the, the, the power of the PC, wanted to use their mouse, graphical user interface, and a, and a locally connected devices like printers. So, so and this started for me like a period of writing native Windows applications. And biggest problem of this of this solution was the lack of auto update like any, when you had a problem and you needed to patch it you would have to manually walk around all your 50 or 100 workstation it was a job for several days so later the native native solution got sort of superseded by the browser based solution and because everything runs on a server again you don't have auto update problems it's actually what i find interesting that it's very similar to that model from 80s basically everything runs on a server and the browser displays data uh, one other thing I would like to, which is worth to mention, is a matter of look and feel. The moment you start writing native applications, the, the strong push to comply with look and feel for that operating system, and uh, and for some reason, like for some reason, this was never never an issue for for web applications. Like Java used to be criticized a lot when when we used to write fat client applications that the that Java applications don't look like a native Windows applications. But with a browser-based solution, nobody ever complained that, uh, for example, Gmail, when you run it on your laptop on a, on a, which runs on a Windows, that it doesn't look like a native Windows application. And my point of looking at, the, at this history was basically to show that what we're experiencing now is actually not that, not that different from what, what happened in the 1990s, that we have new devices, new like a handheld devices like tablets and iPhones. And, and these devices have new features like uh, geolocation or touch touchpad or camera or different sensors. And basically, users expect that their applications will run on these on these devices. So, what what that means for us? We can we can either start writing native applications again, but the difference from 1990s when Windows were quite dominant uh, operating system is the fragmentation. These days, you have you have iOS, you have Android, you have Windows, and different devices run different versions. So it's, it's really, unless you love writing one application three times, then it's really quite a difficult choice. So what are other, other options? Other option is to evolve web and that's where HTML5 is, is important because HTML5 is a step towards this goal to, to turn like a web into write once, run everywhere platform where HTML5 allows you to write web applications which can run without server in a, like an offline mode or you can talk to device specific capabilities like, like I said sensors like geolocation things like that and and also you can store data locally in a browser in a form of database or, or some, some, some other format so as Java programmers, which I assume most of you are, you are familiar that with write once run everywhere always have like a problems, but it's definitely doable. It's there will be challenges. Users will complain that up, our applications don't look native enough, but then we may we may follow it or we may not even try to make them look native. Or, for example, with new latest greatest APIs, there may be we probably 
will be always a little bit behind in this like a web-based solution, but then it depends also on application which, which you are, we are writing. Like for enterprise applications, which are primarily about data and forms, I wouldn't think that's a, that's a problem. So now, so, so it's great, we have HTML5, we can write client applications. And, but our current web applications are written on a server side and how are we gonna do it? How, for example, if you're writing like a part of your application which run offline from a server or which communicate to like a, your device camera, how would you write it on the server side? Like, could we, could we not write it on the server side? Could we write it on a client? And that's, I would like to do one quick recapitulation of, of web application development. Like it all started with static pages. Internet used to look like just like Wikipedia. And then we came with, we introduced the dynamically generated pages. And by dynamically generated pages, I mean, I mean pretty much everything from CGI, satellite, JSP, JSF. And this sort of model solution has the problem that the server is really like a server is in charge of everything. Like whenever a browser needs to do something, it needs to talk to the server and server generates the response, decide what to do next. And so obviously the server is like a potential bottleneck and can cripple the application responsiveness. There, there are a few other issues like we need abstraction from a low level HTTP protocol. The fact that on a server, the, the data are sort of mixed with video presentation template and sent to the browser also means that, that such, a, such a output from a server is not like a cacheable. The browser always have to keep asking for, for example, even for the same page again and again. So over the time we came with, with we built lots of frameworks and they help us to sort of work around or sol sol solve these problems or work around them. But unfortunately, none of, none of these frameworks, is really, they, they got quite complex over the time, but none of them can claim to be like a king of all frameworks. Later, we introduced Ajax into this to, to make pages a little bit more responsive. And basically, the exchange of data from a browser to the server is not limited to request, request and response cycle, but page can ask for data. But the model is the same. The complexity is even increased by the Ajax. And now, if you imagine, if we put into this, into this like a support for offline web application, I think it, it will get even more complicated. So there, there should be easier solution you know, if we look at it from a, completely from a scratch. And, and I think there is like, if when we look when dynamically generated pages were introduced, it was, it was in the time when browsers were like a fairly immature. And so we had to do like a, most of the things on the server. They, but that's been a long time ago. And these days we could move some of the stuff from a server and do it on a browser. And we actually only doing it for, for example, with Ajax. We do a little bit of templating on a server, then the page goes to the browser and browser to Ajax or JavaScript, talk to the server and, and does a little bit more templating. So why not to move everything from a, from a server to the, to the browser? Now, this may look like I'm just sort of shuffling things from the left to the right on my, on my picture, but this change actually is like a, have like a fundamental implications for your application. The fact that templates are static and are on a client means that means that client, like browser, can be very responsive. It didn't have to, basically all it needs from a server are data. And apart from that, the, the interaction with the user can be really like very responsive. The other thing is that templates are like static files. They don't, don't need to be generated by the server. So that means that these static files, you don't even have to have them on a server. You can have them locally. And that's where, that's what we actually need if you want to write web, uh, offline web applications to be able to have that page like locally and, and develop on it like that. And what else? The server benefits from this arrangement as well, especially in a performance area, because server doesn't have to do doesn't have to hold session data which belong to the browser in the first place. Server doesn't have to generate the same sort of template again and again for the client. So, so I think overall this would be like significant significant improvement. Now I think that's enough of theory or history, and let's let's dive into my application. Uh, I wanted to use I wanted to use an existing application and just give it a new new front end. So one application which I found which was written by my colleague from NetBeans is called the Fable Beans and it's a let's maybe show it first. So if I run it, let's have a look what it does. So 
it's this simple shopping cart application. There's few, few departments. You can click on a dairy department, get a milk and eggs, view your shopping cart and proceed to check out. This is just, I don't have like a certificate for it. And then you fill out about it and make a purchase. So it's simple application like that, and it's quite in detail described on a on a on our on our website. It's a tutorial, so you can you can just Google Fable Beans and you will find it. Uh, it's a regular EE application, so it's using there's a MySQL database, then there are JPA entities for it. I I don't want to sort of spend too much time showing you the source code, but so there are JPA entities, then there are EJBs which manipulate JPA entities, and Troy haven't used any uh, web framework. He used directly JSP pages and wrote his own servlet which does the transition from page to page. So now if we look at the application and decide to write a new client, what we what we will need, we'll need a we'll need a data from server. So what data is going to be? So it will be a list of these products so that we can create a page and after the, the card is after user put something in a card, we'll need something to make to make it to make a checkout, to make a purchase. Um, now, how are we gonna get the data from from a from a server to the client? There are, there's lots of options. You can use RESTful services. We can use web sockets. We can use server send events, and it all depends what 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 your what your what your case is. Like in this case, we just really need to like uh, retrieve the products from a server so, and later make a purchase. So we will use rest RESTful services, but if you needed bidirectional communication between clients, you would use the web sockets, or if you want want to be notified asynchronously that something changed, that some other user changed something on a server, you could use server send events to to send the data to your to your application. Okay, let's uh, let's look at the REST services. I have two of REST services here, department service and purchase service. I won't go much in detail how you write web ser uh, REST ser services, but I would like to talk just about this one a little bit. So, this service for given category, it uh, it responds with with a list of products, and I specify that I want this REST service to produce a JSON response because JSON is really easy to, to consume on my on my JavaScript on my on my, on my browser. So that's a format that's the encoding of my or encoding that's a that's the format of my choice. Now, in a signature of the method, I'm using this product JSON class, which is which is here, which is like simple. Simple Java wrapper. I could have used directly JP entities because I have JP entity for products, so I could use that in my signature. But I think this indirection, this wrapper around the JP entities gives me like a more flexibility. It also depends how you're gonna use it or REST service. If REST service, if it's public REST service, then the contract is basically API contract, whatever your service generates. So you wanna maintain that contract and you can't break it in the future. So Having this wrapper allows me to sort of develop and evolve JP entities independently of it and introduce later my REST service number, like a version two with different 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 interface. Because it's just a wrapper, I haven't bothered to write in getter setters. I just put a few public fields and I have control what all gets enco uh, encoded from JP entity into my JSON response. Now, other question is, other question you should be asking is, who and how encodes the, the Java object into this JSON stream. And that depends on what implementation of JAX R specification you're using. In my case, I'm using Glassfish, so and Glassfish using Jersey. So I will be talking primarily about Jersey. JAX R specification has this HPI where you can uh, when you can which implementation can implement and provide different encoders. So if I look at JSON documentation. They have they have several. I would say too many <laughs> different ways how to how to how to encode the, the JSON. There's like Pojo way, Jax B way with four different notations and a low level approach. So let's look at how these differs. But first, how do you conf how do you set up how do you configure in your application which JSON provider is gonna use be used? And again, Jax R specification says that you can. Either enumerate resources and providers you want to use in your application, or you can just let JAX-RS to scan class path of the application server and your application, and whatever it finds, it will use. 
or then there are, if you, if in my case, in a Jersey case, I can use proprietary way to WebXML. So let's look at, let's look at that. Oh. I will use this playground project and uh, so here's my application subclass and I'm enumerating, can you see, I'm enumerating resources. So I, I specify that I want to use department service and a purchase service. And then later here, uh, later here I'm using, I'm saying that I want to use Jackson JSON provider, which is, which corresponds in the Jersey terminology to that Pojo, Pojo one. I'm using class for name here only because I don't want to have compilation dependency on a Jackson library, but I know that in runtime it will be there. So it's a little bit like, okay way to do it. So let's run this service and have a look what it produces. So let's test it. This is okay because I need to specify the, the category. So this is one output. Now let's have a look at it. If I, if I comment out my enumeration and open this oops, in a new window. So now, just by just by letting JXRS to scan everything when it's was on a class, but I got completely different JSON encoding. And the reason for that is that Jersey, by default, you prefers to use JAXB encoding. So that's something to be aware of. And if you if you look at it, I if you look at it, there's like few differences. For example, in numeric values like integer or or price are in JAXB case, encoded as a string, which I think is nonsense. That doesn't make any sense. The similarly, map in the left example, like a map maps really well to JSON because JSON is basically just like map. It's a property value map. So I would think that it should map to JSON really naturally. But in this JAXB case, there's all these like a map entry key dollar type things, which. So choice of, choice of, uh, Encoder you use is up to you, and I guess if you're writing client and the server, you can you can decide and you can you can stick with it. But you should control which one you're gonna use. I mentioned that there's other way, the proprietary JSON way, JSZ way, how to configure this, and that's via WebXML. Uh, if I open my WebXML, I could now if I want to use JSZ way, I could now completely delete the application resource class and just in my in my servlet, also in my WebXML, I'll come in this section and use, and I'm specifying that I want to use directly the Jersey servlet container, and through its specific parameters, I configure. I can configure it and tell it what to do. So, for example, here's an attribute to specify packages to scan. So I specify my REST package, so only the that purchase and a product service will be found. And then we have this attribute POJO mapping feature, which I'm setting to true. I'm saying Jersey use the JSON mapping. Now, again, whether you use Jersey or JAXRS, that's up to you, but there's one good reason which we may need to use a Jersey proprietary way. I personally would prefer to use non-proprietary way because then the application was portable, but in this case, we may have to wait till JXRS to, to help us. And that reason for Jersey is a same origin policy. Same origin policy says that your page with your JavaScript can access only resources from the same domain, same port, and same protocol. So at first sight, it may look like a reasonable, reasonable. And But if you imagine that you have some public REST service, then basically same origin policy prevents you from, from accessing that resource. Similarly, in our case, I would actually want to have a, a glass which which run my server side, having being separately from my client, which are developing locally. So, same origin policy is very restrictive in this case. So, how do we bypass it? Over the time, there were many different solutions for this. There was workaround solution. There was JSONP using iframes, but the way to go is to use cross-origin resource sharing or course. Course is a specification which which all current browsers implement and the specification basically allow allows browser to ask server first whether 
But if it's a remote resource, it can ask the server, can I access you even if you are remote? And the server can decide to answer yes or no. This answer is, is implemented via on a server side where you have your servlet run, uh, servlet which is behind your REST services. That service needs to sort of specify a few headers and they're all prefixed by this access hyphen control hyphen LO. And through that you can control which origin can talk to your REST service. So you can, in this case, I use, I, I give, anybody can access me, but I could specify certain hosts. The similar, I can control which methods and which headers can be called. So, I think this part, I think we are getting to the end with the server side. So I think at this stage we have we finished the server side. We added two REST services. We configured them to produce the JSON format, which we want. And we also allowed them, these REST services, to be called from anywhere. Or maybe one thing which I forgot to show you guys is actually how to do this core stuff. To, and this is the way why I have to use Jersey because Jack's RS specification Current doesn't allow me to configure the headers, but in JAX RS 2.0 it will be possible. So for now I have to use Jersey API, which is a container response filter, and I'm implementing it to setting these headers. And then in my WebXML, I in my configuration of the servlet container, I specify this parameter container response filters to use. And I specify them my one. So this is how I doing it through the jersey. So this is our server side. Ready and like before we move on to the client, I would like to say that in NetBeans we try to make this really easy for you. So whenever you're creating like a new REST service, you are given choice whether you want to use Jersey way or Jax RS way. When we generate any code, we pre-configure the generated code to use um, that simple JSON, that simple POJO JSON provider. But again, you can change it. Similarly with the course cross-origin resource sharing filter, we have a wizard which just create this all for you and add it to WebXML automatically. So, now let's move to the client. Uh, there is, if you are a server-side programmer like me, there's like going to the client, there's one fundamental problem right now and that is that on client there's no Java, there's only HTML, CSS and, and JavaScript and it may change but right now that's all what there is and I don't know what, how what do you think about JavaScript, but my experience until recently haven't been very good. Like I it might be also a problem that I tried first time long time ago, and and at that time tooling wasn't very good. You would write some JavaScript code, you would run it, and nothing would happen. The browser wouldn't do anything, and also didn't tell me about any errors, and I had no idea what's happening. Similarly, the lack of compiler. It's actually interesting when you're trying to learn new language and you don't have compiler. It's like a what I what I wrote is it does it make sense? Is it JavaScript or is it just complete rubbish? So compiler actually that would would help if there would be some. And similar lack of documentation. But I think this is all past. Like if you look at if you look at JavaScript today, that's it's really actually in, as a language, it's not that different from, from Java. It's not anymore about writing this index page where you have like a script tag into which you paste some some JavaScript. It's more it's really about you can pick up from dozens of not sure dozens, but there's lots of MVC frameworks, JavaScript MVC frameworks. You just pick one, build your application on top of it. The framework gives you everything what you would expect from MVC framework. And then there are like a dozens of really good libraries to use. You like writing unit tests? Well, there's no reason why you couldn't do that in, in JavaScript. There's good support for writing unit tests and testability. Tools are getting better and better. There's excellent JavaScript debugger. So I think these days JavaScript is very, yeah, it's very different. And I've been, I must say that writing, writing the client part in JavaScript is actually, it was really refreshing. It's like comparing JSF server-side programming with Swing, Java Swing programming. You, it's like a completely different model. And yeah, I found it, I found it quite, quite, yeah, quite, quite enjoyable. And let's do that. Let's, uh, let's look at the client side. The MVC framework, which I build my application on top of it, is Angular JS, and it's an MVC framework. It's really good MVC framework. It has this super magical dependency injection. 
it was written from a scratch to allow unit testing, which I think is a really excellent idea. If you write unit tests, you know that to write unit tests is really easy, but the setup around it is sometimes the, the, the most difficult part. So solving some of these issues directly in a framework, that's, that's a really good idea. And, and there's probably more. Let's look at the application. Look at the application. You run it again. I want to get it on the browser. So the application itself basically it looks a little bit different, and it's primarily because for styling and layout I use the there's lots of libraries. I I choose the one which is named Bootstrap. It it was done by by two Twitter employees in their spare time, and it's I think it's a really good library. And but apart from that, apart from the look, it does the same. There are these departments. You can you can add something to cart. Here at the top, the number of items in my cart updates. I can go to the cart, see that they are all there. I can proceed to check out, and I can make a purchase. So, application does the same as if you look at it. There are a few differences. What to talk about this? If you look at my URL, it's run through a, a server, but it is really lightweight server which just serves the file. I, it doesn't do any server side processing. Everything is basically local. Now, the templates, as I said, the templates are locals, and and only only communication to the server is done to fetch the data for my list of uh, list of products. So once these get once these get fetched, the application is really responsive. So if I add something to the card, if I go here and if I remove something from card, it's like it's as responsive as it gets. Other thing to mention is the, the layout. I'm using uh, the Bootstrap Fluid grid layout, which which follows the web responsive principle. So the layout adjusts to the to the size of my like a viewport. So if I if I'm here, if I like maximize, you can see that images get a little bit. Oops, where am I? Images get a little bit bigger. If I make it smaller, they get smaller. If I make it even smaller, the the previously horizontal layout changes into vertical one. Similarly, if I go to list of my products, the here the layout is that. There's a menu for choosing the category, and then this list of uh, of the products. So if I if I make it smaller, the menu moves above it. If I make it even smaller, the images start scaling down. So this all got I got for free basically just by using the the Bootstrap Bootstrap library. Now let's look let's look into the application how I implemented it. In. One thing I wanted to say, sorry, that the layout is implemented actually using the CSS3 and and all the uh, media queries. That's yeah, that's I guess worth to note. And okay, now let's look at the application. I think even if you are not Java programmers or JavaScript programmers, which I think you are Java programmers, all of you, most of you. I think even if you are not JavaScript programmers, I I think you will appreciate the sort of the, the, the beauty of the or the simplicity of the application and and, it, and its beauty. Uh, so on client, I'm running everything. Let's make it a little bit bigger. I'm running everything. It's just an index HTML page, which in ID I have I have here this this head part, then this this little menu at the top, the black line at the top, my menu bar, which will be in all pages. And the, the, the most important stuff, the, 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 the body of my page, for that in my index HTML, I just specify this, this placeholder. And, and that ng, ng hyphen view, that's a directive from AngularJS framework, which says this is the place where, where you will be putting some sort of templates. It's, yeah. And let's look, so somewhere else, I have my templates. I have a template for the, for the, for the departments. Which is plain, really simple HTML. Now, how does the framework knows which 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 part which what to put into the body of the page? 
if you look at the URL, the URL has the, the, the URL part, the index HTML, and then it's followed by the fragment, by the, that's that hash part starting with a hash. That's a fragment. And that, if I look at the products, you can see the fragment change into department slash three. If I put something in my card and go to the card, it goes to the slash card. So that fragment part allows me to bookmark the pages and get to them if I need to. And also, it drives what page is going to be used. Here in a JavaScript folder, I have one file where I'm configuring where I'm configuring AngularJS route provider and telling him, okay, if you if fragment of URL is department slash some number, use template partial departments, and that template is gonna use department controller. Uh, now let's look at let's look at the department controller. That's the one which we see if I'm if I'm here. So department pages again. I think it's very simple. This is just this menu which was the left side, and on the right side there's the list of products. So how this is implemented is that I'm you I'm basically saying telling Angular JS through its ng repeat directive iterate over all products, and for each product generate the line of the of the table, and now these products, what it is, how does it get there? Uh, if you if you remember, here is our is it still yeah here's our JSON, and basically the products will be this JSON the way it came from a server. This will turn into JavaScript in a, like a JSON object, and we will the list of these JSON objects will be what's in the in the in the product. So in my template, I can refer directly to whatever it is. So this name, price, and I'm referring it to here. This no other conversion necessary to done, no, nothing else. Let's look at our essential part behind the template, and that's the controller. Whole code for my department controller is this one. So the dollar scope dot products, that's this MVC thing, it's really, it's, it can be really confusing because there's so many different interpretation what MVC and MV and I don't know all these all these other acronyms, but an Angular JS have again their own view. What they say is view. What they say model. But for the sake of simplification, let's say that the scope dot products that's just model, and it's and so I put in my product model. I call this shop query, which is my service. I will get to the services in a second. So I'm calling this service to basically talk to the server, return list of JSON objects, put them in a the product, and and that's it. And I can I can show them I can show them here. I'm not doing basically anything else. If you look at on my page, there is that add to card button. So that button is done on this line. It's basically just button where I'm saying if user clicks it, call method add to card from my controller and give it this product product which is represented by that line. So again, very simple. In my in my controller, I have this add to card method. It gets the product from the from the from the view, and I call second service called card and add product to it. Now, let's look at these services. I one thing I like with the with the Angular JS that it sort of gives you this sort of by default template and and tell and it gives you certain like a layout and with certain files and tell you controllers put in, put into controller JS services you put in the separate files and it makes makes sort of a little bit easier to start and structure the files initially. So if I look at my services, basically this, I'll make it a little bit bigger. This is my, this is my shop service. I, it may look a little bit cryptic and I, I, I still struggle with it a little bit being a new to JavaScript, sort of new to JavaScript, but if you look at it, it's very simple. It's just URL and it, by giving this dollar resource method, which is from AngularJS, by giving it a, uh, URL for my REST service. That's all I have to do, and and client is able to then to talk to my REST service and do all the updates, posts, gets, and everything what I need. One thing as you can see here, I'm giving it a string string name shop, and I mentioned that uh, Angular JS have the, the the dependency injection, and I found it really almost like freaky, like a magical. But but by by giving your service a name. 
you then, the way to get it injected into your controller, for example, one of the ways is that you just specify the name of the service in your method signature, and that and AngularJS will inject it automatically. So the, to me, from coming from a Java, to me this is like really weird, because there's, there's no such a type as a shovel card, but, but it works really well, it's quite powerful. One other thing I haven't said about services, the, the AngularJS basically treats the services as a as a singleton EJBs, they, you, do, you just you don't manage the life cycle, you just get it injected and you just define the service and, and the framework takes care about the rest. My other service, I have actually three services. So there's a shop one which talks to my one service, then there's a purchase one which talks to the other service. And my third service is the shopping cart, which is, which is like very simple Java, Java Bean, which has a list of products and the listeners. I, it's my shopping cart, so I add items to it and it fires events and notifies listeners. As you've seen here, so if I want to add something to the card, I just called card add. And for example, that part which here at the top, which shows the number of items in my card, that's done through this card status controller, which, uh, which I just say card add listener to it. And when the listener is notified, it fires, it updates the the model. It says the, the model, you are either empty or you have some items in it. Uh, I think this will be probably as much as I wanted to say about AngularJS. And yeah, overall, as I said, I'm not a JavaScript convert, but I found it really easy to sort of comprehend the pro project, how it works. It's really easily readable. If you, it's, it's fairly short and it does, it works really, it's, it's, yeah, it's, it works well. So there were a few other benefits writing it, not in Java, but in JavaScript, which are obvious probably. Like I didn't have to compile it, no, I didn't have to package it, I didn't have to deploy it, I didn't need a server. Because the, the client is separate from a server, server business logic, I think it's good, it, it's, it's a sensible thing to do to separate your business logic from a UI. On the other hand, there is certain duplication that the validation some validation which you're doing on server, you still have to do on client, and you have to do it on both ways to make your applications like yeah defensive. Now, to make it really easy, we've been really busy at NetBeans, and what we did with 7.3 release, which should be available sometimes today, maybe tomorrow, is that we provide uh, full support for writing these HTML5 applications. There's, there's too much to say, but I would say that JB, it's gonna have a session at three o'clock, which will even go into detail with this. So if you wanna, if you wanna, if you wanna know more, you should you should visit it. I may just depending on the time, which I think we still have we still have good time. So let's just spend a few minutes on showing maybe a few other things which I which we did in Edwin. So. So uh, you may have seen a little bit of it on the keynote. What we did is that we integrated tightly the, the external browser, the Chrome, with the, with the ID. So for example, if I'm in my controller and I just write here some sort of nonsense, and, uh, or maybe that's too much nonsense, and I press save, at the moment when I save the files in, a, in IDE, they automatically get reloaded in browser. As you can see at the top, there's that NetBeans ID support plugin is debugging this stuff. This is the, the, the the feature of Chrome that Chrome basically tells you you shouldn't use native Chrome's inspect tool and debugging tool because NetBeans is doing it for you. So, and unfortunately, you have to keep it on. If you close it, that basically disables this communication between ID and the browser. So, but hopefully they will get rid of it sooner. You can at least close it or minimize it. But so I saved my JavaScript file. I it got reloaded here. If I now, now click in a category. Nothing happened, there's something wrong. If I go to IDE, I can see that here's my browser log, and here I can see that AI is not defined at a new department. I click on it and, and I'm directed at the place, so I can, I can really quickly figure out where the problems are, save them, page got reloaded, now it works. If I wanna debug what, what Add to Cart does, I can just put a breakpoint here, click Add to Cart, and I'm IDE. I can I can hover over it and see what what product I'm what product I'm adding. So debugging is really easy. That should help as well. 
oops, I did run. And I mentioned unit testing. I didn't look into this. Let's let's spend a few minutes on, on let's spend a few minutes on that. Sorry? I should do that yes, should I? Because otherwise it will stop. Um, unit tests, let's stay with that uh, controller. I have one unit test here and what I really like that, uh, as I said, the setup is really easy. So for example, for my my unit test, I can say that if if, uh, if the AngularJS framework gets this URL, that my code is calling that URL, instead of talking to the server, just mock it up and respond with this, with this data. And then later I can hear Below test this data whether whether this whether this data arrived from a server or whether total works and all these things. So it's really that's really that's really easy. That you can mocking for example that you can you can part of the framework you have like support to 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 deal with separating your unit tests from from remote resources. The the with unit tests actually with JavaScript unit tests it's actually interesting how 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 you run them and. There are probably many ways, and one, because this final application, you run it in the browsers, you run it in Chrome and Firefox. One of the ways which we support now is to run the unit test directly in these browsers, and that's done through, through integration of a, something which is called JS Test Driver. That's some open source project. What it does, it starts the server, you connect browsers to that server, uh, and by that I mean that you open a special tab in that browser and connect to the server and then the server sort of can send your JavaScript to these browsers, they will execute it, they will collect the, collect the results and send it back to the, to the server and we show it an ID. So in this case, I'm just gonna use, let's say the Chrome as a browser, I can start it, it should start, it should create this. This is the sort of slave tab, which now I just, I just ignore it and, and it just this driver server will be using it. What's cool on JS Test Driver that I'm running on Ubuntu, but JB is left of his window, so he could just open his Internet Explorer and basically connect to my server if I gave him my, my, my URL. And then his Internet Explorer would become another slave and I could run my unit test on it. And then what I need to do is just to, yeah, just test the run test and it should happen on the background. And when it's finished, I will get the outcome here. It was run only on Chrome, otherwise I would see all the other browsers. And I think this will be probably probably everything from me. If you want to know, see more, there's all the styling and lots of other things, go to the JB session. And the application I wrote, I put it on a Bitbucket, so you can, you can have a look at it. There's both server side, client side, you can come look at the source code, have a look. And yeah, that's pretty much all from me, I think. So guys, if you have questions, let's let's go for it. Say again, please. So the, the question, I don't know if the microphone working or not, but the, the question is, what are the alternatives to using Easel? Um, pretty much what Easel was designed for was to kind of emulate what you do in the with browser tools today. So if you're using Firebug or you're using uh, Chrome Developer Tools or something like that. You can get a lot of of that same look and feel adjustments and so forth, but um, from the CSS side of it, and then you cut and paste whatever changes you made back into your source code. We tried to eliminate that whole cut and paste thing by allowing us to do that style in source. As far as JavaScript debugging and things like that, um, there, yeah, I don't really, you know, there are other tools out there that provide some JavaScript debugging, but kind of implemented it in a, in a way now that hasn't been done, I mean, there's probably some that have done it, but not in the way. And we're using, that debugger is actually using remote WebKit debugging directly into WebKit. So what the information we get back is coming from the browser itself. We're not parsing it ourselves, we're not trying to figure out what the source looks like, we're actually getting it from the browser live, and then just doing the rendering of it, and, then, and uh, putting in our variable I don't know that there's a replacement for that or an alternative for that. Well, I appreciate that, Mark. We're sort of reaching out to Mark because I think uh, there's some interesting insights. Do you have any insights? No, no, this is just one. So the question was, what do we think about HTML5 versus JSF or Java FX and those things and will JSF die or whatever? Uh, absolutely not. I mean, what we're really looking at is evolutionary time that there are multiple approaches to get to the end solution. I mean, we're not even talking here about native solutions. We used to be, you know, what about phone gap and all these other things that you can do for native? It's just a time where there's there's a lot of ideas and a lot of concepts, and we're 
trying to make sure that within our team, the Java developers have those options to try different things from week to week. If you're a contractor, how many of you are contractors out here with your hands? By show of hands. How many times does the customer tell you that you're going to use a certain technology for client versus server or something like that? I mean, yeah, all the time. So that's really what we're trying to do here. We're not setting a, you have to go do it this way. We're trying to say that these times are a very you know, fluid mode of time. And if you have to use CSS and, and HTML5 for, you know, for a, a response, we, our studies are showing that responsive web design is, is not only a trend, it's, it's most of the designers that are out there doing this for a living view, it is the future, period. Um, so that's what we're working with and trying to drive direction. But it's it's one option of multiple things that are out there. Right tool, right job. Always keep that in mind and, and live with it. I'm going to get this person behind me and off into you. Yes. What, I'm not, I haven't uh, reneged with HTML5. What aspects of that application are HTML5 dependent on? Um, yeah, so HTML5 is kind of a buzzword these days. Mm. It really is the reality of what most people call HTML5 is CSS3 and, and JavaScript, to be honest. Uh, HTML5 itself has elements of new tag structures. It has, um, you know, WebSocket support and all these other things. So, you know, server-side events, that kind of stuff is definitely HTML5. But, so you didn't use any of the, you didn't have any I, I don't think there was anything in there. No. Not really, no. No, I don't think there really was in there. I would think that they will work on different, yeah, that they will, that AngularJS will run as a framework, so it will run on all the different browsers. But when it comes to checking for certain, like, features of a browser, there are, there are other libraries, there's, like, is it resp respond? There's some other libraries which definitely you can, which can test you whether that feature is available on a browser, and you can write these ifs and write it that way. Yeah. There's lots of, yeah, yeah. We're actually integrated directly into the into the WebKit API, so we use Chrome, and then there's also um, using JavaFX's uh, uh, WebView. Yeah, yep, it's yep. WebKit based in, as well, and so we have an internal browser that you can use, which we didn't show here. I'll show mm. a little bit this afternoon. Um, but that that tight integration works with those browsers. You've got to use Chrome. You could probably use Safari. We haven't done a lot with it, but you probably could. Uh, but if you wanted, you'll run it off of Firefox or something like that. It'll you'll run the page, but you won't have all that integration mm. and that live fresh refresh update and the mm. live CSS changes mm. and all that kind of stuff that you saw in the keynote. Uh, so you have to kind of stay there. We're looking at moving into those other things. And this afternoon, I'll show a few more things about uh, graceful degradation and so forth. Within our tooltip, there's documentation. Within the documentation, there's icons of which browsers support that. So if you're starting to use a CSS thing and it's not supported, there are it'll show you all. Help a little bit, but we don't do it directly. It's something that's been requested. We may do it in version two when, when that ever that comes out. But we had to go somewhere with version one. Mm -hmm. Question in the back. Uh, yeah, okay, or, uh, over here. I'm sorry. Right here, right here. Why would it be between brother It's just simple. A matter of you're on your you're on your source. Debug it in Chrome. You got to figure out what it is, and then go back over to your source and figure and fix it mm -hmm. over there. Really, honestly, uh, you know, when we do usability studies and stuff like that, we got people that hate IDEs, and they are perfectly comfortable in the browser, and that's your world. Deal with it and go with go with it. You know, that's fine. Right tool, right job. Again, um, we're just trying to eliminate that whole cut and paste stuff that so many of us have mm. lived through for so yeah. many years. You know, I love the browser tools. Don't get me wrong; they have great capabilities. But you know, writing everything down and figuring out you change six mm. things in your CSS to make it look pretty, and it's like perfect, and you're mm. like, okay. 
And the, yeah. Currently, yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So there's a lot of questions, a lot of desire to see that show up in PHP. Um, there's a desire to have that capability show up inside of a JSF file where you've got a JavaScript tag yep. or something like that. We're looking into being able to do all of that. But in the first release, it's only in the HTML5 project. Yes, in the green. Do you see a whole lot of these That's one of the HTML5 APIs that you can you can basically use API to store the data in a, in a browser. And yeah, I didn't show it, but it's like yeah, it's just it's just it's just it's so simple that yeah, I didn't show it really. Sorry. <laughs> can't really can't really comment on this one. I I really don't know, but as long as it's in a browser. Yeah. Oh, we use it all over the place. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's yeah. All over it. jQuery is about like a, uh, I think jQuery is more, I think jQuery is a little bit like HTML5, the jQuery is everything. But jQuery, I think I, I as a Java server side programmer, I think to me it's just something for like a visual effect to put the things together. While AngularJS is more like an MVC framework, which gives you model, view, controllers, and how to write your application, how to structure it. But if you want to, for example, in my application, if I want to, Something like a, have some sort of visual effects, then I would use jQuery for it. Maybe I'm maybe I'm too harsh on jQuery, but it's sort of just one of these libraries that you can. That's what Angular just does for you. I remember there was the, the model part, the dollar scope, and then the J Angular just have that have that engine and that be automatically whenever you change model in a JavaScript, it automatically refreshes the view. There's, there's really, that's quite, it's quite incredible in there, and I would just go to their website and there's like lots of really good examples how they do it, how it works. Yeah. REST services are by default, uh, they are stateless, right? So you could cache the REST, I would, I would, that's the definition of the REST services, that you could, you would cache that request for the data. You, all the static pages, that index HTML, which I had there on the templates, they could be all cached because they will change only when I put a new version of applications. So they will change once in a half a year or maybe once in a, each month. So these all could be like a cached and be, be static. Yeah. That's, I would say that this is like a low level browser issue. If browser doesn't it, file them a bug that you saying you're as a browser, you are not very efficient. You keep retrieving the resources from a server, which are not necessary, which you should have all in your cache. So I sort of delegated to the other domains problem. But yeah, you could look at it probably in the in the inspect tools in the network panel and see what what it really does. But just playing with the application, I can see yeah, it just yeah, I think it does the job. I actually started with Backbone, and I really like it. It was my first choice. I look at it is it is really evolving a lot, which, which is quite nice on it. That you, there's always something new happening, and people are really passionate about it. It's a really vibrant community around JavaScript. And well, for example, at Java Java frameworks, it's, I think it's sort of settling down and calming down. There's not that many new Java web frameworks. We I guess we're settling down on JSF, but. I had a look at lots of them, just read the forums and a backbone and tried a few of them and a backbone, oops, backbone I liked the most because I think it was the least sort of, it's a library which re, it's easy to integrate with everything else. It does, you, it does only what you tell it to do and which is good, but then also there's this advantage that when it comes, for example, for templating, you, you can pick any templating engine you want and then suddenly which one you use, the, and there's these handlebars and underscore and all these. And I found it, yeah, I think the big bone is mainly that model. Then when I, AngularJS is, I think the version 1.0 was released maybe like three months or a few months ago. And when I look at it, I was, I was really impressed with it because I thought that they put all these things together, they tighten it up, you have less flexibility maybe, you have to like fit within that framework. But the framework does, does things so well 
that I yeah that's why I basically dumb the backbone to be to be honest. So. The CSAP in three o'clock is actually something built into seven dot three beta that it's actually based off of backbone. We we added it's it's you know, it's a V one let's put it that way. Um, but it's a it's a wizard that you if you have a running REST project. So you have the source code to the REST project. You can run a wizard that will generate a backbone MVC off of your RESTful code. It inspects the code, finds all your all your uh, you know your uh, resources and everything else, and then just generates the whole MVC side. And you can even there's an option in there to generate a table sorter UI on top of it too, if you want a starting spot. It just mm -hmm. generates an HTML file with a bunch of or not HTML file, just an HTML file with a bunch of uh, mm -hmm. Uh, templates and so forth in there, but it, it defaults to no UI, so you just generate the, mm. the infrastructure. But uh, we decided to write that one off of Backbone originally, and that's it's still there off of Backbone. Mm. One other thing with, with AngularJS, which I like, is the support for like a unit testing, because the fact that you don't have compiler, if it's really hard to make sure that your application is still like a run and everything. So you actually have to write more unit tests than you would do in Java, where compiler helps a little bit. So that was other strong argument that I, I think the unit testing is essential. Yeah, yeah, from IntelliJ okay. guys, yeah, yeah, IntelliJ guys, yeah. Question here? Let's say I think because they are completely like a different, they they don't clash with each other. But in your application, I guess you would have to sort of mark certain line. The, it might be difficult, like to try to create the same UI or the same behavior. So unless you you want to risk that, if you have a workflow in your application and half of the workflow is the old one and the other half is the new one, so it'll look a little bit weird. So I guess if you sort of make a cut through your application inside this part, this subset of functionality, I will rewrite into HTML5 first, then. Yeah, that, that should that should be really easily doable. There should be any conflicts or clashes. It's just basically like a completely separate way, and then you would just basically link from the new part to the old one. There will be some tricky issues, but yeah, I don't. I'm not. It in theory it should work. Yeah. But we haven't done it. Yeah, we have, I, I can't say yet. The theory but is everything delves in the details. So yeah. Try it. Your mileage may vary. Whatever other word I can put in there. <laughs> yeah. Yes, over here. Yeah, so uh, you say about the JUNIT framework that it has. Does it do all the units that run on like a Jenkins server? You could do that. I think that's what that people that's what people do. That yeah, you would set up that server, you would have it run on a background, and then Jenkins would yeah execute it. Yeah, yeah, it's different. I think if you have, I think how and I yeah, it's just in theory. I think that you would have your your Hudson or Jenkins, and that would run the unit test, and you can specify the URL of the server on which to run the uh, the run the unit test. So you could. On the same box, you can run that server with few browsers open, or you could have browsers open somewhere else on some other computers, and it would, within your intranet, it would just connect to it, send it there. Because in theory, if you want to test different operating systems, then you need to have two remote. You don't have Windows box, Mac box, and yeah. So it's 12.30, unless there's any other questions, we've got to wrap it up and get on out. Right tool, right job. If you if your if your environment allows you to run JSF and you know JavaFX or whatever and that and that's what your developer staff is most comfortable with, that's what your customer wants you to do, then go ahead and use that direction. This is simply one of those opportunities that is the as the the delivery landscape changes, we want to be ready to help if that's what you want to do. I. 
I honestly, I'm not exact. You know, I can't answer that question honestly. I, I, because I haven't spent enough time out there with all the customers, understanding exactly why they're doing one thing or another. I think responsive design is something that is really starting to take off in in desire because you're writing one app and it and it actually adjusts down depending on the device. It, it, yeah, sure you could. Yeah, definitely. And. I don't. I don't think anybody's going to. If anybody does give you, and you know, when you ask that question and they say, "Oh, it's just this, this, and this," be very skeptical, because I don't think it is there. Could be. I mean, I again, I've got a really old phone, and running JavaScript on my phone sucks. But if I'm running on an iPad or something like that, then it's really, really quick. So you know. I, I don't. I don't know that there's an exact answer for that yet. I. I think the, the question is still a valid question, and it still needs to be shaken out by a lot of different people. And it depends on, you know, is it an enterprise that has everything locked down to Blackberries only, and you know, in those secure environments, or is it just, you know, a startup that's that wants to make sure everything runs on, you know, a, a jogging app that makes runs on your phone or your, you know, whatever iPod while you're out running around. It's, it's right tool, right job. And as long as we're providing from a tooling perspective, which I'm the PM for, for Easel, so I look at it from the NetBeans side, not necessarily the larger technology stuff. In that regard, I want to make sure that we're providing the capability so that if you do run into it, you know, you run into a consultant job where the guy says, yeah, I've got all this EE stuff and we've written RESTful services, but I want I want you to be able to put, make all my stuff HTML5, you know, and they don't know what HTML5 is, and you guys say, okay, well, I'll write it in CSS and JavaScript, and I'm going to use HTML4, and they'll go, oh, what? Yeah. They don't know. But if, if that's what you're being told to do, you have the opportunity to do it and work with it. That's, that's why we're doing it.